All right, what's up? This is RC Apologist, and we are doing a formal debate on the topic of was Mary a perpetual virgin? For those who are new to this particular concept and this type of debate, um, ultimately what that means <coughs> is was Mary, uh, like after the birth of Jesus, did she remain a virgin? Um, this is a question that's been debated amongst the Protestants and Catholics, and joining for the debate to discuss this particular issue is um, a well-respected Catholic friend of mine by the name of Catholic Fusionist. So, that being said, we're well, going to... Hmm? Well-respected? Don't bear false witness now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, at least to me you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. But it's so respectful to the point that we don't even need a moderator for this particular debate because uh, we, you know, have done these debates several times before in the past with others. Um, we are well familiar with the rules and well familiar with how to respect these rules and um, lines of uh, engagement. So we're just going to do it like this. 10-minute opening statement, 10-minute rebuttal, 10-minute cross-examination, and then five-minute closing statements. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and it's since this is, is the was Mary a perpetual virgin and my opponent affirms the position of that, he will be the first one to go. And I, of course, will be the one keeping the time uh, on my thing. Just to double-check, are you on your computer? Uh, I am, yes. All right, so I'll just uh, send you then through the group chat thing that's in here. Um, what, how much time you have left, so that way I don't have to like just say it during the middle of your uh, uh, opening statement. Fair enough. All righty then, and with that, um, the floor is yours. Uh, time starts when you're ready. Okay. Um, before beginning, I'd like to thank my interlocutor, Reformed Christian Apologist, for hosting a second Marian debate. By the way, that's your cue to start the time. The first debate went well, and this time I thought it well to continue with the same strategy. Scripture, scripture, and more scripture. The point of these debates is to change the minds of your interlocutor. And while apostolic tradition indeed is valuable, the most convincing arguments come from taking your opponent's position and working within their set of assumptions. While I would like to bring in apostolic tradition, it doesn't, in my experience, convince someone who only accepts the Bible as authoritative and tradition at best as a handy guide. However, in doing so, I'd like to forego any appeal to tradition in this debate by my opposition. I do not care that someone like, like I don't know, Tertullian did not believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. The greater tradition speaks against him for me, and, and his words must be tested against scripture anyway for uh, my friend RCA. I would like to cite something important, though. The f making, uh, being a proponent of the perpetual virginity of Mary... While it is a popular, well, it is the Catholic position, is not something inconsistent with Protestantism, and doesn't make you less of a Protestant. In fact, the, many of the early Reformed uh, Protestants held to it. Now, um, here are just a few quotes. Uh, Zwingli: I firmly believe that Mary, according to the words of the Gospel, as a pure virgin, brought forth for us a son of God and his childbirth, and after childbirth remained a pure intact virgin. Um, this is from his, this is from the Corpus Reforientum, or Reforium, uh, my Latin is terrible, please forgive me. In the Samoclad, Luther writes that the son of God became man in this manner, and he was conceived without the cooperation of man by the Holy Ghost and was born of the pure, holy, and always Virgin Mary. John Wesley writes in Letter to a Roman Catholic, I believe that he was made man, joining the human nature with the divine in one person, being conceived by the singular operation of the Holy Ghost, born of the blessed Virgin Mary, who as well after uh, she brought him forth continued as a pure unspotted virgin. Francis uh, Tertullian, uh, uh, Territon, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, wrote, this is not expressly declared in scripture, but it is piously believed with human faith from the consent of the ancient church. Thus, it is probable that the womb in which our Savior received the auspice of life, once he had entered into the world as from a temple, was so consecrated and sanctified by such a great guest 
that she always remained untouched by man, nor did Joseph ever cohabitate with her. Um, notice that in Territon's comment, he's not speaking of this as dogmatic, but any like any other Protestant, you could accept this just from a probabilistic standpoint. And finally, Thomas Cranmar, who uh, was the first Archbishop of Canterbury after the uh, dip, after uh, Rome was deposed from England, and of course he led Anglicanism into the Reformation. Moreover, all of the said church fathers prove her perpetual virginity by this text of scripture. And he goes on to quote Ezekiel 44 too, which I'll get to later. And Thomas Cranmer actually makes, a, a, goes far beyond Territon and says that the church fathers themselves, uh, Augustine and Jerome said to deny this was a damnable heresy, meaning if you reject this, you'd be damned. Now, if, now, I as a Catholic might disagree with another Catholic about that limbo, for example. I, I hold to it, and there are Catholics who deny it, but I wouldn't make a salvation issue out of it. How, how strong does your interpretation have to be to make a salvation issue out of something? Um, how am I doing for time, by the way? Uh, all right, never mind. These men were all violent opponents of Rome. They had every reason to judge Rome mistaken, and yet they found right reason with con consultation for scripture in most of these cases to be their guide. Today, I want right reason to be our guide. I want us to reason about scripture by asking which hypothesis fits the data of scripture better. We have two hypotheses. Let's call the hypothesis Mary was a perpetual virgin, the ever virgin hypothesis. And let's call the hypothesis she was not a perpetual virgin, the event virgin hypothesis. That is, she was a virgin solely meant for the event of Christ's birth. Here, I argue that the biblical data supports the ever virgin hypothesis over the event virgin hypothesis. Our first verses are from Luke 1, 26 to 27 and 31 to 34. And in the next six months, the archangel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. You shall, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him to the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? This can be a very complex argument to follow, but let's read carefully. Mary is betrothed to Joseph. The angel says, you shall conceive in thy womb and, you, and bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. This is the future tense. Mary shall or will according to some trend, according to most other translations, give birth to Christ. Mary asks, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, Mary knows the angel is speaking in the future tense because she asks, how shall it be, future tense. It's going to happen in the future, not now, sometime after the angel visits. It's an indefinite amount of future time. One would think that if she was about to get married in the future, Mary would infer that she was going to have a child by having sex. It's the natural order. But no, she doesn't. She asks, how is it possible to give birth, seeing I know not a man? Unless her virginity was planned to be maintained, Mary comes across as an idiot who doesn't know where babies come from. Not only does this verse serve as a strong piece of evidence against the event virgin hypothesis, but supports a form of the ever virgin hypothesis, the one I support. According to Saint, uh, ep, ep, uh, let's see, Epiphanius of Salamis, Joseph was a widower who took Mary as a spouse for the sake of protection and that he was too old to consummate his marriage. Mary was a temple virgin who took a vow to preserve her virginity. And this would explain why she was planning to stay a virgin. In the annals of church history, I think this, theory fits the data best. This, the brothers and sisters that are mentioned in scripture are not from Mary, but rather are his stepbrothers and stepsisters from Joseph's prior marriage to the woman who widowed him. Now, the other popular one is to say that Jesus, 
that those were his cousins, um, which is which I maintain is possible, but I'll put that to the side for now. In John 19, 26 to 27, we read, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith to her disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his home. In the Jewish law, the oldest son, alive, has the majority control of the estate of his father. Deuteronomy 21, 17. The mother was part of the father's estate if the father left no male heir, and then it would be passed down in the following manner. Tell the Israelites that if a man dies without leaving a son, you shall transfer his heritage to his daughter. If he has no daughter, you shall give his heritage to his brothers. Um, the brothers of the father, so uncles. If he has no brothers, you shall give his heritage to his father's brothers. Oh, wait, never mind. Uh, uh, if the father's... Ha if the father has no brothers, you shall give his heritage to the nearest relative in his clan who shall be taking possession. Oh, the brothers of the eldest son. N never mind. So we actually have an instance of this um, in Ruth 2. Naomi had a powerful relative named Boaz through the clan of her husband, Elemech. Um, of course, uh, Boaz, is, of course, Naomi's two sons died. So she was transferred to Boaz. Yet Mary does not go to Jesus's younger brothers, but to John. Either Jesus was disobeying the law and handing over part of his father's estate to his friend uh, rather than his brothers next in line, or even his sisters, his uncles, or someone else in the clan um, who might not have abandoned him. Or Jesus, having no siblings, was the youngest of Joseph, was handing down a part of his estate, which was fully his to own, uh, which was fully his own. To John, Jesus said, do do you not think that I have come uh, to John? Uh, Je so Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, do you not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. If Christ is the fulfillment of the law, it makes no sense to say he did not fulfill it in some sense, nor could he have had a held inheritance from his brothers and sisters for abandoning him. I'll make two arguments as to why. If they were disqualified from their inheritance, why did Christ reinstate James as a disciple and head of the Church of Jerusalem? After all, upon forgiving and reinstatement, James would no longer have been a disobedient son, but a devout follower, righteous man, and worthy heir. Two, it's also oh, in it's time. Oh. Shoot, I had a whole thing on Ezekiel, but all right. <laughs> Well, at least that's where we get the time for the uh, rebuttals to hope to try to fill some other things. I hope I'm able to make room for all the other stuff. Uh, oh, no, no so. worries. My bad. Uh, go ahead. All right. So, all right. I'll begin my uh, statements. Um, I I would likewise have to state and thank uh, my opponent for uh, being uh, able to come to this particular debate um, this morning. And I can already tell by the way that I'm going to see some skeptics, cat, rather Catholics or atheists, that are now going to, instead of me saying um, and such a lot, uh, that they're going to take me saying uh, particular a lot for this particular discussion. See, I just did it again. <laughs> That's particularly troublesome. And I know, and I need to uh, get get that particular problem checked. Um, <laughs> but, um, but anyways, so the, in this debate, I am to refute the concept that supposedly Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life, that she was the ever virgin. <coughs> so to open my statement and to get to my points, I'd like to quote uh, the scholar Merrill F. Unger in his Bible dictionary entry on Mary, where he says the following under the heading, was Mary the mother of any other children than Jesus? Where we read, the question whether or not Mary was the mother of any children other than Jesus has caused almost endless controversy. Of course, the advocates of her perpetual virginity assert that she was not. On the accounts of Matthew 13, 55 through 56 and Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it would seem more than likely that she had a number of children. This presumption is increased by the fact that the persons named as the brothers of Jesus are mentioned in connection and in company with his sisters and mother. So, Unger quoted two texts. Let's look at the texts. Matthew chapter 13, verse 53 verse through 56 says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his Sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? 
And the same thing is then repeated again in Mark 6, 3, which says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and, Ju and of Judah, or Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters with us? And they were offended at him? So, now we got these passages that talk about the brothers of uh, Jesus. Now, before we dive fully into the word study here, uh, in the Greek term, that is Adelphos as brothers. There is an entry um, in the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Dictionary by J. D. J. J. D. Douglas and Merrill C. Tenney in the revision by Moises Silva that we read, quote, The term is used in the New Testament in identifying four men, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. It is also used collectively of a group of people whose names are not given. John 7, 3, Acts 1, 14, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. The precise relationship of these men to Jesus has been much debated with three different answers. Number one being the position that I obviously affirm that it's referring to the actual biological brothers. Two being Joseph's children were from a previous marriage. But three, that they were cousins of Jesus, son of his aunt Mary, wife of Cleopas. Now, I don't know which one of these other positions but my opponent will take. Uh, so we'll see when the rebuttal comes. <laughs> but in going with the Greek here, Thayer's Greek lexicon concerning the word Adelphos here in the text uh, says the following, uh, that for even given, even citing the example of these passages of Matthew 13 and Mark 6, 3, that it is defined as, quote, whether born or of the same two parents or only of the same father or the same mother. Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary, a definitely good academic work on word study, says that defines the term by saying it, quote, denotes a brother or near kinsman, and the plural, a community based on identity of origin of life. Even defining Matthew 13 verse 55's context to mean, quote, male children of the same mother. Mounts' expository dictionary says that the Greek word, quote, has a wide range of uses in the New Testament. A closely related word, Adelphi, means sister. He even goes on to say that even Jesus had brothers and sisters, Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Though some argue that these are stepbrothers and stepsisters or close relatives such as cousins paul however understands james the head of the jerusalem church to be jesus's brother galatians chapter 1 verse 19 so dealing with that particular text that's what we what we got with concerning the greek sources and the greek lexical dictionaries now to further settle the case on the Adelphos issue, we will cite two citations from the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary on page 240 um, on the entry of brothers from Mikey and C. Parsons. The New Testament also reflects the use of the word brother to designate a physical relationship. Luke mentions that Herod and Philip are brothers. Luke 3, 1 goes on to say that the four brothers of Jesus are mentioned in Mark 3.31 and named in Mark 6.3. And then furthermore, in page 1063, we read the following from Clark Palmer, who says, In later tradition, a natural tendency to appreciate Mary took on added and unwarranted dimensions. All appearances of Mary, goes on to say, all appearances of Mary in the Gospels support a view of her as a normal human woman. Matthew chapter 1, verse 25 indicates that after the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary began normal marital relations, producing several other children. And that is seen, uh, of course, in the verses that we went over. <laughs> So let's look at Matthew 1.25 to see what is meant here, which it says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The word in the Greek is uh, new. Uh, he, uh, the word for new is gnosko. And Thea's Greek lexicon defines it to mean, quote, is used of the carnal connection of male and female. The examples are given are Matthew chapter 1.25, Luke 1 34, and then going to the Septuagint examples, Genesis 4 1, Genesis 19 8, and 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 19, as well as even citing from the uh, Greek Septuagint of the Apocrypha, Judith chapter 16 verse 22. Even in these Old Testament verses, the passage seems to indicate sex because what's going on in Genesis 4 1? Adam knew Eve, and then eventually that 
knowing Eve, begot Cain as a result. Now, according to this, Mary and Joseph didn't have sex until the firstborn son, Jesus, was brought forth into the world. And that's what we're seeing here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, while understanding the Greek text here of Gnosko. So by the testimony of Matthew, in his account, and I'm pretty sure within uh, Luke as well, the, the couple would indeed have sex and produce more children naturally, and we see who their names are later on in the text. However, some Catholics try to argue that till doesn't mean that it is a change, such as what Trent Horn argues in his book on uh, the case for ca Catholicism. Quote, that's because the Greek word translated until in this passage, house, does not always refer to a change in condition. So we see in Thayer's defines it as, quote, with the genitive of the neuter relative pronoun, uh, or ado, it gets the force of a conjunction until, till, the time when. The example used is Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, follow, quote, following, followed by the indicative. Other examples of this are Luke 13, 21, where we see the context is clearly of a change in condition. Examples that Horn used, like Mark 12, 36, fall under a different meaning due to the context. Thayer says about this particular context that it's, quote, with av and the aorist subjunctive, equivalent to the Latin future perfect, where it is left doubtful when that will take place, till which it is said a thing will continue. So based on what I have presented, the evidence is clear that the perpetual virginity of Mary would have to be in rejection of what we see in the historical record of the account of the New Testament. And just so my opponent is clear, I also will have church father sightings as well, but that's for the rebuttal period. But to finish my statements, um, I would like to at least quote a Roman Catholic scholar on the subject uh, by the name of Raymond Brown in his book on the birth of the Messiah, where he writes on page 132, in my judgment, the question of Mary's remaining a virgin for the rest of her life belongs to post-biblical theology. And my opponent quoted somebody that likewise said the same thing, that what we're seeing is not scripture, but rather that it comes within tradition. So, in other words, a post-biblical theology. So the theology comes from tradition after the biblical tradition. And as I've noted in the past presentations and debates, I believe that the early church fathers affirmed Sola Scriptura based on their quotes. So they would not want us to rely on them for the source of what is true doctrine to follow, but to go to the scriptures. And that the scriptures show a lack of evidence for such a claim that Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life. And with that, I yield my time. And whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to go. Thanks. I'll start right now. Uh, for starters, the church fathers actually would quote one would quote one another and look at the past. So, well, so as a source, at least as a very helpful guide, I'd say they would definitely want us looking back towards them. In fact, uh, the person I quoted, Tariton, said that because in post biblical theology many of them declared this to be such the case, it was most probably the case. So, and from what I remember, sola scriptura is not solo scriptura. So. The so definitely the words of the past need to de be heeded if my opponent is to take his own word seriously. So lo, my, solo scriptura is Bible alone, believer alone, whereas sola scriptura, from what I recall, is um, when the interpretation of the scripture has to be uh, taken into account alongside with tradition amongst other sources. And the church fathers are not a bad source to cite, but not probably not the main source in any case. So my opponent ma mainly cited um, a few verses in Matthew, which I believe can be dealt with very simply. In, tr in terms of the word chaos, we actually use it used other times within the Septuagint. In 1 Samuel 15, 35, we use the word chaos. The day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Did Saul so until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Does that mean that uh, Samuel visited Saul after he had died? No. And Saul's daughter, um, Michal, bore no children from that day on until the day she died. Until his chaos. This is Samuel 2, 6, 23. While they originally, while 
they were originally written in Hebrew, the Greek translations of the Old Testament, which were good enough for the New Testament writers to cite, use heos as the appropriate translation, meaning that they were acceptable uh, to use at the time. And in Matthew 12, 20, we read, a bruised reed will he not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. Will Jesus, and this is the word chaos again, will Jesus just be breaking reeds and quenching candle wicks over his victory? Or will, or will he cease acting peacefully altogether after he defeats the forces of evil? Or let's, and uh, yeah, here, yeah, here the word until does not limit an action to just before such a time. It doesn't rule it out. In terms of uh, Jesus's brothers and stepbrothers, uh, sorry, in terms of Jesus's brothers, um, I believe them to be stepbrothers. I take the Eastern tradition. They are associated heavily with his mother, as are his sisters, but that's because they're part of his father Joseph's estate. So there is room to believe that their connection was still strong. In fact, um, fam in fact, because they were in a collectivist society, you're much more ample to believe that they had a stronger connection. After all, who would leave alone and abandon your father, uh, your father's uh, wife after he passes away? Is there no filial obligation? And stepbrothers and stepsisters are sisters and brothers. The term Adelphus and Adelphi apply to these terms just as much. And Paul calling James a brother does not discount him as a stepbrother. In fact, the term Adelphus had been used to refer to even spiritual, uh, even uh, people within the Christian community. It can refer to a spiritual connection. So it uh, the same... So the same term doesn't necessarily apply to just physical uh, physical brothers and sisters, but uh, can also. But I do believe them to be brothers and sisters in a sense, just step brothers and sisters. Now, um, just to top on with the one more quote from Ezekiel forty four one to three, then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh towards the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, the gate shall be shut and it shall not be open and no man shall enter it because the Lord, the God of Israel hath entered in it. Therefore it shall be shut. It was for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in to bread, to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate and shall go out of the way of the same. To explain the verse, um, in Augustine and St. Ambrose, both affirm that this the gate in question is Mary because Jesus uh, is is coming into creation much the same way the prince here or the angel is going through the sanctuary. And of course, as we know, Jesus is not leaving creation, just and he shall not and no one shall enter in back through the gate. That means Joseph or any other man will not enter back in through the womb of Mary according to uh and they're not the only ones who share this interpretation it's also shared by john cassian who lived in the third to who lived in the uh, fourth to fifth centuries uh john of damascus who lived between 676 and 743 a.d um jerome held to this interpretation as did uh, rufinius um one of his companions this was a common belief so we also have passages from the a passage from the Old Testament which hold to this. In terms of church fathers who have alleged to deny the perpetual virginity, the only one I can affirm is Tertullian. Um, if uh, origin is usually brought in, but unfortunately, Jerome is sorry, unfortunately uh, origin is not a good source because to cite because when he says that Jesus had brothers. That word could obviously be meant as a reference to stepbrothers as well. And Jerome, and not, I keep mistaking the two. And Origen himself actually uh, says that um, in his commentary on Matthew, Mary did not bear any other children. Um, he says, the book, the Proto-Evangelium of James, records that the brethren of J Jesus were sons of Joseph by a former wife who he married before Mary. Now those who wish to preserve the honor of Mary and virginity to the end, so that the body of hers, which was appointed to minister to the word, might not know intercourse with the man after the Holy Spirit came into her power to overshadow her. Or 
um, and of course, there is another uh, church father who is cited, and he was cited by Helvetius. But even that church father only says that Jesus has brothers. You can't conclude from the fact Jesus has brothers or uh, James was the brother of Jesus to saying that it was through Mary. Of course, because stepbrothers are brothers. You don't need to further on make that distinction. Family is family. And I don't really see how that infers that Jesus, that um, James was anything but a stepbrother. I think that when scholars usually, I think when you look at a lot of uh, modern biblical scholars, and uh, just to address a few other things, Raymond Brown, pretty liberal, as even for a Catholic scholar. He also claimed that according to biblical criticism, uh, one, um, the, the, narratives of of the uh, nativity that is the birth narratives of christ were added to scripture later on um he had his theology was more informed by biblical criticism than it was informed by a solid presupposition of the christian worldview uh, which is very sad for me to say because he was a catholic scholar and a priest and as and just to add a couple more things most modern biblical critical scholars who are in the in the Protestant tradition usually shoo, uh, shoo this away, but I don't think that addresses the scripture that I marshaled and cited. I think that modern biblical scholarship is a little too informed by biblical criticism. I think when it comes right down to it, it's much better to trust in the tradition, which um, we have every reason to believe was guided by the Holy Spirit. Even if you're not a Catholic, then surely you believe that the Holy Spirit was reliable in passing down church doctrine. And I trust the power of God much more than I trust the uh, the wisdom of man. And with that, I yield the rest of my time. All right. Thank you for that. All right. So I'll start my 10-minute rebuttal uh, now. Okay. So going to the beginning of my uh, – thing he mentioned that you know the only one he could think of was tertullian and he gave some other possible um examples of early church fathers that would um be in tertullian's camp and denying the uh the perpetual virginity of mary but as far as i'm understood there's actually very various others um that exist uh, for example as i was reading yesterday at books a million um especially founded in Eusebius's church history, uh, it seems to be of Julius Africanus um, seemed to share the view that in talking about the genealogy of Christ uh, and keeping a record of the David Davidic descent, presumably this heritage gave him special honor in the church, it seems that based on what we read in chapter 7, by the way, of where this comes in, of uh, book 1, chapter 7, that we see mention of Jesus indeed having some relatives um, in his case. And the same thing could then be said of a certain individual, Clemson, book uh, eight of his hypo, hypo, I can barely pronounce this, hyptoposis, uh, rings James before Peter and implies he was one of the apostles after his resurrection the Lord, part of knowledge to James the just and John the Peter and named part of the main apostles. More explicitly says Jude was Joseph's son, but not Jesus' blood brother, Jude, who wrote the Catholic epistle, being one of the sons of Joseph and the Lord's brother, a man of deep piety, though he was aware of his relationship of the Lord, nevertheless did not say he was his brother, but said he, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, because he was the Lord. He was his Lord, but brother of James. For this is true, he was his brother, being Joseph's son. And this is quoted in the Lightfoot uh, translation, by the way. So, there's one other instance of this. And in fact, it seems to be suggested that even Basil the Great of the 4th century um, admitted the possibility of Mary ceasing to be a virgin after the birth of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that at some point that Basil, uh, you know, was kind of, you know, denying or anything like that. I'm saying that he did hold to contradictory views, in my opinion. And in, though I don't have the source, it is quoted by a scholar named Harris on page 236. I'll have to find where specifically the book is at on this. But again, I'm at least quoting the words so that way people can then not just take my word for it, but do some investigation. The words, he had no intercourse with her until her son was born, do indeed afford 
a certain ground for thinking that Mary, after acting in all sanctity <laughs> as the instrument of the Lord's birth, which was to bring brought about by the Holy Ghost, did not refuse to her husband the customary privileges of marriage. But as for ourselves, even though this view does not does no violence to rational piety, yet lovers of Christ cannot bear to hear that the mother of God ever ceased to be a virgin. So there's those particular things. Now, I want to get on word um, with my rebuttal to that, of course, you know, the Kim's de Sola Scriptura, they wouldn't view themselves as the ultimate authority. So I agree that the church fathers did not just simply cite, you know, scripture, but they also cited each other at times. And in fact, if you read a certain epistle from Augustine where he's defending original sin as a historical doctrine, that's definitely flooded with church father citations um, before his time, all the way to people, you know, like Clement of Rome. So I agree indeed that there is this uh, sort of, you know, citation of the church fathers, but the issue is who is the ultimate authority in that? Is it the uh, church fathers or scripture when you go to each of these which is going to have the most ultimate authority and based on citations i have shown in the past i believe it is quite clear quite, quite clear and possible even from people like cyril of jerusalem and others that they don't want you to just simply take their word and just blindly accept it or anything like that to test what they're saying with the scripture and so that's why I'm hoping that with my opponent that we do just like he mentions that the best way to convince in this particular argument is by going to the scriptures for this uh, case. Speaking of which, he mentions 1 Samuel 13 verse 35 with the chaos term. And I noted that there's other verses uh, that would seem to suggest um, the usage of that as least is defined in uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, uh, that there's multiple meanings that this is able to be used in my particular understanding this seems would be fine with what was known as the uh, the quote of and the ior subjunctive equivalent to the latin future perfect where it is left doubtful when that will take place till which is said a thing um and there's other definitions along that um but other examples of this is in matthew 2 13 mark 6 10 mark 12 36 luke 17 8 and luke 20 verse 43 for more, you can see the actual lexicon that provides the full list of the citations um, and the definitions themselves. So I would agree that the term chaos would be used here, but as we noted, depending on the structure and depending on what term, what tense it's in and what the what follows, there is a sort of defining context that applies to the particular meaning of the text. So we have to keep that in mind here when going to the other verses that cite this. Um, so I would hope there's also some lexical um, and scholarly support for this uh, word mean, having the same kind of meaning. And therefore, then we can then go to the passages elsewhere where chaos is used, like Matthew 1, uh, 25, that try to indicate that they have the same exact type of context. Now, the stepbrother interpretation cited is not really able to be supported by scripture, unfortunately, as is noted again in the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Dictionary when we went over the three different views that were out there. Uh, it says for number two, quote, they were, Joseph's they, they were Joseph's children from a previous marriage. This view is possible. So note, it could be possible. But he says, quote, but it has no support in the New Testament. So in other words, sure, it could be a possibility, but in order for it to be de demonstrated for this to be the case, my opponent would have to provide some sort of historical data that would prove this. And so far from the eyewitnesses themselves, as is noted in this from the scholars, that there is no New Testament support for these people being stepbrothers instead of just actual biological brothers, as was noted with the Greek of Adelphos in the text. And he even mentioned the possibility of it being just like a, uh, you know, just the brethren of Jesus, like, and like, you know, like my friend is a brother in Christ and we go to the same church for that. Based on what I mentioned earlier from, I think uh, either it was a vines. I think it was, yeah. Vines complete expository dictionary that it has to be in the plural in order for it to refer to a sense of community. Um, at least based on our analysis on it. Every time so far that we have the study, it refers to a brother in a biological sense, especially when we're naming specifically um, this individual. We have to focus on how the Greek was used of this structure. Now, 
I admit that Dr. Raymond Brown is a liberal Catholic scholar, and I would disagree with some of his statements based on the data, as some of the false statements he made that my opponent noted. But I agree with him here because there is data to support what he said. Um, and as you mentioned with one of your citations earlier, that it is indeed mostly found in uh, church tradition and church fathers um, that pre that post date um, the biblical text. And so that's why I didn't think there would be too much of a problem with citing it because it pretty much Raymond Brown uh, with his quotation in the birth of the Messiah pretty much said what, what one of your uh, scholars had said uh, earlier. So there's really not much then I would have to do on what I have in terms of what else you said, but I do want to at least touch on another thing. So we have the issue of the brothers of Jesus. I wish that there I would like for during the cross-examination, and maybe there will be times I'll try to write some questions down for this, that we get some answers on how then do we deal with what is in the Thayer's and Vines and in um, Mounts' expository dictionary, which are very well-respected academic sources of the lexical word studies of the Greek language. Um, to concerning these passages we read of in Mark 6, 3 and Matthew 13 about the brothers of Jesus, especially when they are named specifically. And then deal with the other scholars on the matter, like Mike C. Parsons and uh, Clark Palmer. Now, I'm not saying that just because they say this, that means they're right. But if they're wrong, we need to at least get into uh, specifically why they are wrong from an academic, from an exegetical standpoint with hermeneutics, with lexical support. And I hope that this gets uh, done. And with that, I yield my time, and uh, we're now moving on to the cross-examination uh, portion of the debate. So um, whenever you're ready, uh, Max, your time starts now for your questions. Oh, all right. Um, so first question, would you agree that I did cite scripture, at least in my opening, as proof uh, to provide proof for the perpetual virginity? Yeah, I don't deny that you would uh that you cited scripture to help to you know uh provide a case and such. Um, I do oh, believe oh, you oh, did that. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, my and you would agree. So, all right, so I did provide scripture out to support my case. I you might not find it convincing, but I did provide scripture. Right. Okay, so my case. So you would also then agree that my case isn't wholly dependent upon the church fathers. Right. I believe that even in the Catholic Catechism, I believe it's, a, uh, as I have cited on here, I uh, believe it's uh, 500 um, in the Catechism on page 141 in the book version, uh, in the citation and the footnotes, it does go to like, uh, you know, citing scriptures for its uh, support. Okay, that that's fair. So let's go to the uh, pulpit commentary. Till she had brought forth her firstborn son, thus the angel's promise is thus far fulfilled. Her firstborn, though found as early as Teraton Deities, having been added from Luke 2 7. Though no great real stress can be laid on the word until, Basil refers to Genesis 8 7, compare also Psalm Exit 8, nor even the firstborn, which suggests a Jew rather consecrated than the birth of other children. Uh, do you uh, recognize where this is from? Uh, what I quoted. Mm -mm. Uh, it's from the pulpit commentary. Well, um, right, yeah, as you said, mention that. Oh, okay. Uh, so it is. So there. Would you consider the pulpit commentary to be a scholarly source, uh, source of information? Based on my research of the uh, pulpit commentary, um, I would say it's in some ways definitely a scholarly thing, but it's also mostly just. Uh, written by uh, pastors um, kind of thing based on my understanding of the composition of the commentary and who was specifically working on it. But that being said, I don't think that just because of that, that means automatically we are to dismiss arguments that are presented in it. That would be committing the genetic fallacy. Fair enough. But do you also think that because it, because you can consider it to be scholarly, at least in a sense, that it is at least worth taking into consideration before making a conclusion? I definitely think that any source that provides them should be taken into consideration to observe the data that it provides and then examine it with the facts and the other data. 
fair enough. Okay, I'm good with that. So uh, let's just go on to some of the verses that I cited. Um, the first verse I cited was, I'll go with uh, John 9, 6, 7. So you would agree that in Jewish law, if the, elder, if the eldest son is to pass away or die, the estate would go to his brothers. Would you agree with that point? Repeat that again. Or would you agree with the... Would you agree with this point that if a son was to pass away, the eldest son was to pass away, then he shall, um, then the per people who inherited his property would be his uh, brothers. I believe that that would be the particular case. Yeah. And you would also agree that the wife of the, of the father who passes away is part of that estate. But the wife that is part of that Estate, yes. Um, I mean, as far as my understanding, I mean, I'm not too real researched in this history, but um, I'm just going to say that at the moment, I would believe so, yeah. All right. Um, well, to just give an example from Deuteronomy, uh, uh, tell the Israelites, if a man dies without leaving a son, you shall transfer his heritage to his daughter. If he has no daughter, she'll give his heritage to his brothers. If he has no brothers, you shall give his heritage to his father's brothers if his father has no brothers you shall give his heritage to the next to the nearest relatives in his clan who shall take possession of it um given this verse since it doesn't mention anything being given to a wife would you then think that the assumption is that the wife was left destitute or that she was just taken care of with what's left of the possessions so asking if uh what my view is on if she just were simply taking care of the possessions or with her own? Uh, my question is, would she be left destitute uh, because she's not mentioned as an inheritor? Or would she be taken care of because she was a part of the estate? Hmm. As far as you're talking about like in general within that law, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the law specifically stating... The law, the law gives a chronological list of who inherits uh, okay. a man's possession when he passes away. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it says without if he doesn't leave any sons, so the sons would inherit it, specifically the eldest son, who yeah. in another verse gets more of the share. If he has no brothers, you shall give his heritage to um, his brothers. And if he has none, then his heritage is given to his father's brothers. If his father uh, has no brothers, you shall give his heritage to the nearest relative in his clan. Mm -hmm. Notice uh, also in Ruth 2, it says Naomi had a powerful relative named Boaz to the clan of her husband, Emelech. Um, in Ruth 1, uh, if you've read Ruth, um, I'm assuming you have, right? Yes, I have read Ruth. Oh, okay. Yeah, her two sons passed away and she's left to be taken care of by someone else. Um, don't, you, you would agree that that's good evidence to suggest that she would go along with the inheritance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's so this is uh, Jewish law, and yet Mary is not given to uh, Jesus's younger brothers, alleged youngest brothers, but mm -hmm. to John. Right. So would you say that this was a case of Jesus disobeying the law? No, I don't think that Jesus would be disobeying the law. And why not? Uh, because for him to disobey the law, I think there would have to be a clear thing. That shows that just simply, for example, um, he doesn't seem to um, be viewed as against going against the law when um, he allows certain people to, uh, you know, not practice the Sabbath in the way that it is mentioned um, in the law. Because, you know, he's going with the idea that they aren't under the obligation of the law, as is mentioned in some of his texts. The only thing that is really a binding is to him. So um, I don't see where uh, he would be breaking it because he would still. Uh, be practicing those practices, uh, but I don't see anywhere where Jesus in any part of any text um, is in violation of the law because that would break the prophecy of the Messiah. Okay, so you don't believe Jesus. So you don't believe Jesus would disobey the law. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay, and yet the law does claim that there is a specific list of people who would get the inheritance of his mother and the estate to take care of. Why are we assuming he wouldn't fulfill that law? Why are we assuming he wouldn't fulfill that law? 
Yeah, are, yeah. What I'm asking is, did he not? Are you claiming he violated that law? If he didn't violate that law, then, um, then we would assume that he had no younger brothers, or then he had no obligation to pass down the estate as the eldest brother. Mm -hmm. But if he did break that law, then would he not be considered a false messiah or a sinner? Because, well. His job as the Messiah is to fulfill the law, as stated in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Fulfill them, yeah. Yes. So why? So my question here is, is he not... Uh, my question here is, is not his obligation then to pass it to his brothers if that is the law? As far as that, I would uh, say that it would be, uh, you know, if they would be under the law. Uh, as far as him passing and dying, as you mentioned, um, but his death does do away with the law. So yeah, no, it, is possible, it, is, it is possible for for that. But at the same time, but he, when, hmm? but he doesn't die. But he does this before his death, though. Okay, so it does it before the death. Yes. And I thought you, based on what you said, it sounded like he was the person that died before then it be passes on to another. Um, I mean, like I said, I think it's very possible that it's a, that he does follow within with it, follow through with that. Right. But he, so when, so he says in John 19, 26 to 27, that uh, to John, behold, this is thy mother, uh, mother, this is thy son. He, this is before his death. And he specifically makes somebody the uh, inheritor of something before he dies. This, if this is not breaking the law, it is at least intent to break the law at this point. All right, and time's up, so I'll add, answer that question. Um, I don't believe that he was intentionally trying to break the law. As I said, I don't believe that he is breaking the law um, in these certain aspects. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not sure I comprehend the answer, but sure. Right. Uh, 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 we should move on now. All right. So I'll go ahead with mine. Um, and I'm still trying to work on it because I haven't been able to get the questions written down. But I'll go just proceed and try to get it, do as much as I can. So and so we're, we've dealt with Matthew 125 when you... Um, I've tried saying that for your case, um, that the word chaos is used in such, for example, like a, I think you've mentioned first Samuel 13 verse uh, 35, uh, as one instance in the Septuagint. Yes. So, um, is, do you know for certainty that that shares the same context in its usage and application in the Greek with, uh, what we read in Matthew one twenty five? Can't, what do you mean by same context? Because it, no two situations are alike. Obviously, right. there's a huge difference between someone dying and not being raised back to see someone, as opposed to right. uh, you know uh, an instance yeah, fair of enough. sex. Fair enough. Um, mm -hmm. I guess what I'm meaning is like a, a lexical or a literary context, because as I've noted, um, for the term that is uh, uh, utilized, um, there are instances, for example... Um, in Thayer's, it says that with the definition used for Matthew one twenty five and Luke thirteen twenty one, um, it uses a genitive of the neuter relative pronoun, and it gets a uh, the force of a conjunction um, because of that, um, followed by the indicative, especially when it goes directly to Matthew one twenty five's definition. But for examples like Mark twelve thirty six. Um, and I would say at this point, if you're, we're talking about uncertainty of when this will be uh, done, um, then Thayer says that this is with a certain thing. I can't really pronounce the Greek here, but it looks like av or au. And the and when it has that and the aorist subjunctive equivalent to the Latin future perfect, uh, it is left doubtful when this event will take place, till which it is said a thing will continue. Um, so there seems to be based on uh, Greek uh, context within the uh, what pro what type of a 
place it's in, whether it's a neuter relative pronoun or an aorist subjunctive or any of these other things, that there's a context that helps define its specific term. Do you have any um, understanding of the Greek to point that out or any lexical support from a scholar uh, uh, that shows a word study to help us go into this that supports your case? Um, actually, I cited one in my question period. I cited um, a particular commentary, which was um, which was the pulpit commentary, and they actually uh, they actually cite a specific use cited from Basil in Genesis eight seven. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's uh, when a particular uh, raven is sent out uh, until the waters go down. It doesn't mean that the raven was and kept flying and. It doesn't, uh, or the specific verse is, and sent over to Raven, being Noah, it kept flying back and forth until the waters had dried up uh, from the earth. Now, it doesn't mean that it kept flying back and forth after the waters. It, um, it doesn't mean that it stopped flying back and forth after the waters went down. And, of course, they cite the Greek word uh, till or chaos in this situation. And uh, say that this is a particular case where it can't be laid out. And this is, of course, a more scholarly commentary uh, that does it. So mm -hmm. I'd say so I'd say that this is one instance um, of a scholarly source. And let's see. There's uh, um, uh, yeah, you know what? I'll just go with that for now, and maybe we can continue on the discussion. Okay, so I'll have to take a look into that to see to deal with it, and I would recommend that the audience does the same thing to deal with some of the statements made. Um, so, but when even even then, if it's uncertain or anything like that, um, it seems to suggest in the verse Matthew one twenty five when we read it, uh, whether it be in English, Latin, or Greek, um, and even in the New American Bible itself. Um, a Catholic translation of the Bible uh, says that just like he did not know her until she had brought forth the firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Uh, so it said, says, and he did not know her until or till she had brought forth her firstborn, not just in other translations, but also even in the Catholic translation that I think is very well respected is the known as the new American Bible. Um, uh, right. So, so, I mean, wouldn't that reading itself, regardless of the English or the Greek or anything, just at that point give us this understanding like that? Like it's No, be uh, oh, definitely not. Um, and here's why. Because it's laying out the fact that Joseph fulfilled his end of the promise, not okay. the fact that afterwards they went on to conceive. Um, right. I'm saying yeah. even if we're going with like the idea that it was like we're not certain of when this happens, but that it would happen because it does say until. Well, from what I'm aware of, it's not a good exegetical practice to take one verse in isolation. Of um, course. Right. And even, and we'd also have to examine Matthew in light of other verses. Um, and given um, other verses that I cited from John and, of course, uh, from Luke, it seems to me that the uh, tradition that these are his stepbrothers and that Joseph was an older man who was widowed far better explains this than the idea that they were a new newly married uh, couple okay so you believe that these were so then your interpretation because there is of course um debate among uh people my, uh, my interpretation would be the same as epiphanius i would say that the verse here is referencing the fact that joseph kept his end of the bargain but because joseph was an older man he probably would have no interest or need in con in uh, further um and producing further children. Mm. But you would affirm that when it refers to the brothers of the Lord, that uh, compared to cousins, you would affirm, affirm the view that is especially affirmed in 500 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that says that um, these would basically be stepbrothers belonging to um, not just Joseph, but would it be described as, quote, the other Mary? The uh, uh um, Right. Um, in turn, I'm not sure what you're getting at with the other Mary. Um, well, the catechism um, that's that she's mentioned in Matthew 13, 55 and Matthew 28, 1. And this is just from uh, the, the catechism citation that it's uh, quote well, saying Matthew yeah. significantly calls the other Mary. Right. Um, 
in, in any case, uh, the catechism, um, the tradition I'm studying is from the East and usually espoused by mostly the Eastern Church Fathers. The idea that those were his cousins were uh, was a position advocated in the West by men like Jerome and Augustine. Uh, I personally prefer the Eastern tradition uh, myself. I think it better fits the evidence, but I don't think the idea that they're cousins is off the table completely. Okay. And and oh, and I'd also state that it's more than just a communicative sense of the word. Uh, I think that family is family, and stepbrothers are definitely one's family. Mm -hmm. So, would you believe that? Uh, would you agree with the statement from the scholars in the Zondervan Bibleist Dictionary that, while the view of it being like, for example, uh, children from a previous marriage is possible, would you agree though that it has no support in the New Testament? I do not know because again, um, math again Matthew and Luke themselves sorry John and Luke themselves provide good insights on t into believing why uh, it, Mary and Joseph did not have a traditional marriage. Uh, you... One from the fact that his mm -hmm. oh in John from the fact that Jesus's brothers uh, Jesus could not give an inheritance of of his father's estate, especially of Mary, to to people who did not. Um, uh, to uh, to uh, someone who was not his brother or close relative, and two from uh, putting uh, Luke, wherein the angel says, "You will have a son, and his name will be Jesus." Mary points to her virginity. Now, um, it's a future tense word. Uh, the angel says, "You will, uh, in the future, have a son." Mm -hmm. Mary doesn't. Mary's engaged at this point. If it was a traditional marriage, you would think she would say something along the lines of, oh, yeah, because I'm getting married. Of course, I will in the future have one with Joseph. You would make that inference rather than making the inference to the contrary of saying, wait, uh, no, no, I'm a virgin. Like, I, I don't know. I have not known a man or I do not know a man. It was in the present tense. It, the, these would be two instances where I'd say scripture does provide good support for that narrative. Okay, then. Well, that's really all the questions I have time for then. So we're now moving on to the five minute closing statement. So whenever you're ready, you are, you're free to uh, close out with your uh, five minute closing statement. All right. Well, I'd like to thank, uh, our RCA, thanks again for having me here. I'd like to state that in this debate, we mostly uh, touched on church tradition rather than um, focusing on scripture, although we did come back to it a little later in the debate, which was nice, um, especially in Matthew. Um, in terms of my understanding of the Greek, um, I'd state that while I might not be too expound in uh, learning and understanding the Koine or um, Greek in general, there is good scholarly opinion to state that heos is not is not necessarily going to refer until after um, doesn't necessarily entail that after they consummated their relationship. Um, Paul, the pulpit commentary gives um, some good reason to think otherwise, and I think this is definitely something we could study at a future time. Um, Luke. Uh, the perpetual virginity can definitely be defended in scripture. It's defended in John. Sorry, it can be defended with John 19, 26 to 27. It can be defended uh, with uh, Luke. And it can be defended, of course, with Ezekiel 44, verse 1 to 3. Many of the church fathers interpreted Ezekiel as speaking about the Virgin Mary and prophesied thusly. It, in my, the idea that these were Joe. I think the idea that uh, these brothers necessarily had to be sons of Mary is, in this debate, indeterminate. I th um, and I don't think anything in the New Testament gives us any indication to, to tell us that James or any brother was a full brother as opposed to a stepbrother, as Adelphus can refer to either or. The... Although there is usually a prophecy cited in the Psalms, which I guess, which speaks of uh, my mother's sons, even then, Mary could still have adopted uh, the, the brothers of Christ that uh, Joseph would have left um, on as her own. There's no indication that says that that couldn't be the case either. And even then, 
when it speaks of my brothers abandoning me, even David himself uh, speaks of his own iniquities. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everything in that psalm translated over. On this is a, a doctrine that has had plenty of support from various early Protestant refor reformers, even when even in the case of Francis Territon, when he said that it's not expressly declared in scripture, although this doesn't rule out that he thought it could have been implicitly declared in scripture, he still at least said that it's more probable than not given what we know of the church fathers. Of course, uh, of course, Luther, Wesley, and Cranmer would all have agreed with the Catholic position as well as Wingley. The citations of the church fathers usually came down to citing Christ having brothers, but even I would claim that Christ had brothers. I would just say that the nature of their relationship was that of stepbrothers rather than as full brothers. And again, because jo Jesus was the son of Joseph, and of course, because Mary uh, married into that family, Jesus... Uh, Jesus would probably have called these uh, brothers stepbrothers, and they would have probably called stepbrothers because that's how everyone else understood it. No one would have, especially the unbelievers, would have brought uh, bought the case that um, it was not true, uh, that Mary had a virgin birth. And the designation of stepbrothers, I think, is a proper designation nonetheless. Um, I yield my time. All right. Had a minute to spare, man. You know how to keep track of your time. All right. I try. <laughs> All right. So I'll lead the, the last five minutes of this. All right. So once again, I would like to thank my opponent for uh, being here this morning um, over from where he is at. And I notice we do have different timelines, but uh, we do our best to try to work around those schedules to have these respectful debates that are definitely needed and uh, will be filled with information that will help either side uh, make their decision as to which to affirm, as well as those who are in the middle um, to decide who is making the um, best case for which. Now, I believe that, again, as I've mentioned, the best support that I've gone to has been within the lexical analysis of passages such as Matthew one twenty five, concerning that Mary would, uh, you know, have relations with Joseph, and that is mentioned in Matthew one twenty five, Luke one thirty four, Genesis four one, Genesis nineteen eight, that these all share the same context of quote used of the carnal connection of male and female, and even the apocrypha Septuagint uses Judith sixteen verse twenty two with its case. Now, I also believe that, you know, uh, that this is because of that, that, that's what resulted was reproduction that, as we see in Ma Mark 6, 3 and Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 55, 56, that Jesus uh, was having relatives that were born of the same uh, pe two parents, as is noted by Thayer's vines and Mounces, um, and that these are. Uh, the lexical analysis that we can look on the computer these days and do the study and the research for ourselves. So don't just take my word for it. Examine this stuff for yourself and notice what the literary context is for this. Because remember, in my opinion, of course, I, I don't know if he would agree with me here, that I think the best way to engage in the exegesis of a text is to engage in the uh, historical grammatical method of interpretation, which implies to go to not just simply the historical understanding, which as I mentioned, there's church fathers that can agree and affirm my particular position um, alongside with Basil the Great and Tertullian and others, that you also have other writings um, that are found in the text, not just in the verses that we cited, but others. And so because of that, we must examine the literary context, the context that involves not just um, what is in the uh, environment of that word, but also in terms of the present of what tense it is in. And that's why I mentioned the, the citations of the scholars in terms of what tense, what, if it's a, you know, what makes it exactly a, a conjunctive to begin with, um, in the original Greek language. So again, these are things that we must consider about it, not just simply a historical context, but a literary context as well. Now, so I mentioned that with Matthew 13, 
and Mark 6, and then even the passages about Matthew 125, which I think to me, Matthew 125 would be an excellent, uh, you know, home run hit um, on that. But again, as we've shown, that doesn't mean that they'll always agree. I don't think there's anywhere that is going to be um, a good support in the New Testament or the context of the stepbrother's interpretation, because as noted, while it is possible, um, the only way that you can really get that conclusion is of a speculation and that there's really no direct support in the New Testament, um, as has been noted uh, by Merrill C. Tenney um, and J.D. Douglas in the Zondervan Bible Illustrated Dictionary uh, concerning the term, the phrase brothers of the Lord, that the natural reading that seems to be accepted um, among scholars um, is number one, where it says, quote, they were younger children of Mary and Joseph. This is suggested by the reference to Mary's, quote, first child, Luke 2, 7, but is rejected by those who insist that Mary remained a virgin throughout her life, unquote. Now, as I say that this is even the was the scholar Raymond Brown notes that this is, quote, in my judgment, the question of Mary's remaining a virgin for the rest of her life belongs to post-biblical theology. So while I agree that you could certainly go to the church fathers, um, what we must understand is that they would also then tell us to go to Scripture. And the Scriptures indicate, um, based on what we've done the analysis of on my particular case, that Mary did not remain a virgin. She had more kids especially for the four brothers of Jesus, the brothers of the Lord, and that even Paul recognized this as noted in Galatians 1.19. And so with that, I ask you, read and understand what we have made for our case, and you make the decision yourself on who made that convincing case. And with that, my time is up, and uh, thank all of y'all for coming and participating, especially for Max for showing up and being a part of this. All right, yeah, you're welcome. All right, and so who knows what the next one will be? Maybe Sola Scriptura. Um, that that one I definitely think will need a lot more time to delve into Sola Scriptura versus whatever the other position would be um, for that. But, uh, but anyways, thank y'all for tuning in, and uh, hope to see y'all next time. Till then, take care.